So at this point, I'm, I'm so happy to introduce Heather Holm, who is an author and biologist. She's based out of the Twin Cities. They actually didn't get a lot of snow um, last night like we did here in the, in the Midwest. Um, Heather is an um, accomplished author. You may have one or more of her titles. Um, her most recent book on wasps, really beautiful imagery in all of Heather's books. She's a, an amazing photographer out there in the field taking pictures of all kinds of insects and plants. And her program you'll see is, is also just so greatly enhanced by those, those images, the two bumbles on, actually the two bumble images, the three bumblebees on the screen in front of you are Heather's uh, images. And I also see that Heather has a new book coming out, Common Native Bees of Eastern, um, Eastern United States. I was able to pre-order that one yesterday. So um, you'll definitely wanna check out that link to find out more about Heather's books. Um, a very accomplished presenter, a researcher. She's out there in the field all the time. She's very active on iNaturalist. Um, and we're so happy to have her this morning to talk about bumblebees and the native plants that they enjoy. So Heather, um, thanks for being with us. I'll let you go ahead and um, share your screen. Thanks, Denise. Well, it's, it is a pleasure to be here this morning and I'm sorry to hear about those of you that have had a, a lot of snow to shovel after this <laughs> webinar. Uh, we've had really cold temps in Minnesota, so not as much snow, but anyway, as Denise said, and it's, uh, I'm uh, really thankful for being uh, continued to in uh, and continually in, invited to these uh, webinar series. I, I really enjoy talking about bees, of course, and today I'll be talking about probably one of the most charismatic group of bees, the bumblebees. Um, my friend likes to call them flying teddy bears, which I think is a, a great description. And so uh, Denise asked me to talk about the plants for bumblebees, and I was trying to figure out how do I arrange this presentation to make it intuitive and this is sort of an overview of, of the things that I will be covering but I decided that I would just um, combine all of these things into a seasonal phenology. So I'll talk a little bit at the beginning about why bumblebees are different from other native bees and introduced bees um, and then sort of go through starting in spring a uh, nest initiation uh, and then what is happening in the landscape with flowering plants uh, for the different casts of bumblebees. So I'll, I'll finish off by telling you a little bit more about some of the plants that I featured throughout the presentation. I know some of you are tuning in from uh, the Pacific Northwest or the Southwest. So some of the plants that I'm featuring today may not be applicable to where you live. So I've done a couple of slides at the end um, that summarize sort of plant families, key plant families for bumblebees and hopefully you can utilize that information and apply it to uh, the region that you live in. So with that, I'll get started. Uh, bees, of course, many of you I know are already uh, bee aficionados, know a lot about bees. And of course, uh, the general public really isn't aware of uh, the bee diversity that we have in North America, North of Mexico, uh, 3,600 species and then worldwide, just narrowing it down to bumblebees specifically, uh, we have about 250 species. And then in the United States, 46 species of bumblebees. And if you live east of the Mississippi River, uh, 21 species. And as Denise said, I'm in Minnesota, so we sort of straddle the Eastern and Western populations. So we pick up a few more species. Uh, in the state of Minnesota. We have anywhere from 23 and sometimes 24 if we get a real uh, Western species traveling East. Um, so really it's dependent on where you live, uh, how many different types of bumblebees that you may see out foraging in your garden. And then of course, uh, bumblebees are sort of unique in our native bee world. They make up um, that sort of remaining 10% of native bees that don't have a solitary uh, lifestyle. And so their nests are social, but if you compare their nests, of course, to the most recognized bee, the honeybee, which is a highly social uh, species of bee, and they have very large nests, anywhere from 10 to 40,000 bees living in managed hives. And bumblebees, on the other hand, have very small uh, social nests. Their nests 
are anywhere from producing a few hundred bumblebees in a growing season to uh, up to 700 if, it, if it's a longer growing season. So the big difference between the, the two, the honeybees and bumblebees is that bumblebees have an annual colony. So it's not perennial, They're, they don't um, live in a hive like honeybees do surviving on food stores and, and therefore have a perennial colony. The bumblebee colony is annual. So what, as I walk you through the bumblebee life cycle, just keep that in mind at the end of the growing season, um, that colony will cease to exist. The inhabitants, the queen that initiated that colony will, will perish in addition to any remaining workers or, or males. Uh, the remaining 10%, besides bumblebees, some of our sweat bees also have varying degrees of sociality. So some are, do have truly socialness, uh, some semi-social, uh, even communal, where two females share a nest but provision their own brood cells. So it's a real sort of spectrum in, in the native bee world, but for the large majority of native bees, they have a solitary nest. So a single female bee is uh, establishing the nest and then foraging in the landscape to collect pollen and nectar and bring those materials back to the nest to prepare inside of a brood cell to feed her larva. All right, so why are bumblebees kind of fun and interesting and different and um, adorable, you could say. Uh, they, they really occur in many eco regions, but uh, in, including the Arctic. So, and that is one thing that they have an advantage of being able to forage in cool temperatures and they can also thermal, thermal regulate. So they uh, shiver their thoracic flight muscles, uh, a similar mecha mechanism that they use if they were to uh, buzz pollinate flowers. Um, but the large sort of the greatest diversity of bumblebees uh, occur in temperate regions. So if you're tuning in from the Southwest, you would you have high, very high native bee diversity, but not as many bumblebee species as we would further north in, in the temperate region. Uh, and then of course, bumblebees are very effective and efficient pollinators of a lot of the different flowering plants that we grow in our gardens or in, in natural landscapes and partly due to their size, uh, their ability to manipulate complex flower forms they have long tongues so that bumblebee squeezing itself into the blue lobelia flower on this slide. Um, that's quite an easy feat for that particular bumblebee, but smaller native bees would uh, be expending a lot more energy and struggling to get that flower open in order to gain access to the nectaries. Uh, bumblebees also demonstrate floral constancy. So if they leave their nest, the, forage, the foragers or the workers, uh, go out into the landscape, they are going to show a little bit or quite a bit of fidelity to one particular plant species. So that really in turn for the plant helps with pollination. So they're, they're moving around pollen from flower to flower of the same species. And then bumblebees often don't get credit for the significant amount of pollination that they do of many agricultural crops here in, in the US. And I've just listed a few that are commonly pollinated by bumblebees. And because they have a social nest with queens uh, emerging from hibernation in early spring, they, they, their phenology uh, of the different castes, the queens, the workers, and the males uh, overlap with pretty much all of the different uh, flowering agricultural flowering plants that require insect pollination. So that's kind of what I've put on this slide to show the 100% overlap. And of course, depending on where you're tuning in, that phenology would be slightly shifted. You may have apples blooming earlier than the first week of April where you live. But the point is, is that bumblebees have this 100% overlap of many of the fruit trees, small berry crops, and then what I call the summer vegetable crops, the tomatoes, eggplants, peppers. So uh, it's, it's just another reason to attract and bring in uh, different bumblebee species, particularly if you have a home vegetable garden, they're really helping with 
a lot of pollination. And one reason they are more effective and efficient pollinators of some of our agricultural crops, such as blueberries here on the slide or tomatoes, is they, like many bees, have the ability to buzz pollinate flowers or sonicate flowers. So that symbol that I have, I'll be utilizing um, throughout the presentation that represents uh, the flower is sonicated by a bumblebee. And what is buzz pollination? Well, it's essentially the bee shaking the pollen from the flower. So in the case of blueberries, blueberries have uh, uh, inverted anthers with small pores. And so that pollen uh, needs to be shaken and, and dispersed out of the holes or pores uh, in order to be uh, collected by a bee. So that picture you can see that's a queen bumblebee and her, her activity coincides with the flowering of cultivated blueberries and she's sonicating that flower. You can see the pollen flying. And similarly, the, the solanaceous crops, the plants in the nightshade family, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, tomatillos, they are all plants that require buzz pollination. So um, one reason why bumblebees are more effective because uh, the introduced uh, honeybee is unable to sonicate flowers. So you can imagine there are a number of advantages to buzz pollination. Uh, a single visit while they vibrate that flower and extract a lot of pollen would be equivalent to a, a bee visiting many different plants to collect a similar amount of pollen. So they're really uh, extracting a lot of pollen in one single visit that saves them a lot of time and energy expenditure. And then of course, you can just see from that picture that queen bumblebee is moving a lot of pollen around from flower to flower, which is helping obviously with pollination and fruit set of uh, these agricultural crops. And as I mentioned earlier, bumblebees have, uh, they're big, they're probably one of our largest native bees, maybe besides the large carpenter bee. And so just their size alone uh, provides them with strength. They can manipulate complex flower forms. So in early spring, as they're flying through woodlands, they may encounter Dutchman's breeches, that image on the left, and the females have to pry open two sets of petals. And then the nectaries are located at the top of the flower, the, the breeches. So their long tongues uh, enable them to extract the nectar from the flowers. So small bees would have a really hard time doing that flower manipulation and opening of the petals. And so bumblebees are what I call really good multitaskers because they're able to push open complex flowers, uh, access the flower's reproductive parts and extract either the pollen and nectar that they're um, seeking. And then of course they are some of our longest tongued native bees. There are really sort of two groups if you look at all of the bumblebee species, um, they're grouped either in short or long-tongued. Um, the long, we have more long-tongued bumblebee species, so their tongues can be as long as 14 millimeters. And so you can imagine with complex flower forms, such as the examples on this slide, long flower corollas where the nectaries are pretty hard to reach. Some, uh, medium and small native bees would have a very difficult time because they're tongues simply aren't as long as bumblebees. So bumblebees can really have a broad spectrum of different flowering plants that they're able to access uh, nectar from because of their long tongues. So of course, bumblebees uh, have a similar diet to other native bees. They, they are vegetarian and their diet is comprised of resources produced by flowering plants. Uh, pollen is, is providing them with their, what is kind of their meat, their protein and, and fats, and then nectar, their carbohydrates and amino acids. So it's the combination of the two uh, floral resources that are um, collected and fed to offspring. Now the females are uh, actively out visiting flowering plants to collect pollen, whereas the males are simply nectar feeding. It's pretty uncommon or unusual for a, a bumblebee to be consuming pollen while visiting flowers, but it's not uncommon for some of our solitary native bee females will be 
actually consuming pollen while they visit flowers. But the, the visits by bumblebees are usually for um, either uh, feeding on nectar, collecting nectar, or collecting pollen. And pr plant preferences. So often bumblebees get called generalists, and you can think of them as being generalists at the genus level. So collectively, the 46 species in the US uh, with their long phenology of their, less, their nesting colony cycle. Uh, you can imagine, I showed you just how they overlap with different agricultural crops, but uh, the colony itself and all the foraging casts uh, overlap with uh, many different flowering plants in the landscape. But even given that, at the species level, um, they do show some plant preferences. So they're not necessarily generalist at the species level. And those um, preferences are obviously guided by uh, their seasonality, where they are, their geographic range, and then some of those physical traits that I talked about, their, their tongue length and their overall size and inability to access and manipulate different flowers. So I just want to touch on um, different ways that native bees collect pollen and how that is different from bumblebees. So this is a slide of um, three different types of solitary native bees, or uh, in the case of the green sweat bee, uh, she, she nests communally. But anyway, uh, we have six families of bees in North America. And one of those families, the, the leafcutter bee, the females uh, collect pollen on the bottom of their abdomen. So this is something to look for. And I know probably all of you tuning in are what you would call bee watchers. And so if you see a female with the hairs on the bottom of her abdomen covered in pollen grains, then it's likely a female in that family. Most native bees have hairs of varying lengths so that like that metallic green sweat bee, as she forages on flowers, she'll groom the pollen to those hairs on her hind leg. Sometimes the pollen adheres to the side of the thorax or the edge of the abdomen, and that can confuse people sometimes, um, thinking that because there's pollen on the abdomen, it may be a bee in the leafcutter bee family. And then of course, nature always has exceptions to the rules. So the uh, master yellow face bee, which looks like a very tiny uh, mason wasp, and you can see the female uh, really doesn't have any external hairs. So she instead collects pollen by ingesting it uh, in addition to nectar and then storing it in her crop. So that's how most native bees collect pollen, but bumblebees, in addition to honeybees, are really the only two bees that you would see out foraging in the landscape that have pollen baskets or corbiculae. And they, it is essentially uh, an, an enlarged tibia on their hind leg. You can see the blow up here on the slide. So that tibia is uh, flared. It has a concave uh, smooth indentation where pollen is packed. And then it's surrounded by stiff bristly hairs to help hold that pollen. So the worker on the left image, you can see her corbiculae are loaded down with pollen. Uh, bumblebees will often uh, combine nectar with the pollen as they groom and pack it on their corbiculae. So that's why it often looks um, shiny and a little bit different consistency like uh, compared to the dry pollen grains that I showed you on the previous slide with the solitary native bee. Uh, and then another exception to the rule. So there's a subgenus of bumblebees that are cuckoo bumblebees. And they are uh, bumblebees that invade the nest of uh, another type of bumblebee, uh, drive out the queen, and then take over laying eggs and forcing the workers to rear her offspring. So cuckoo bumblebees lack pollen baskets. So you can see where my arrow is pointing. This is a lemon cuckoo bumblebee. And um, because she doesn't have any role or need to collect pollen, she's essentially just going into a nest, driving out or killing the queen and uh, making the workers forage for pollen in the landscape. So cuckoo bumblebees just have two casts, the, the queens and, or the females, egg laying females, and then they produce uh, males and new queens. So they don't have workers because the, the hosts become the workers. <clears throat> 
All right, these are some terms that I just sort of came up with to give you a sense of what to look for if you're observing a foraging bumblebee visiting flowers. So they're, they're not scientific terms, but I thought they'd be kind of fun and memorable to help you, uh, you know, have specific things to look for while you're watching a bumblebee visit a flower. And what we really need um, citizen scientists to help with is to help parse out when a bumblebee visits a flowering plant, is it actively collecting pollen or is it visiting that flowering plant to consume or collect nectar? So buzz pollination, as I mentioned, is, is a very um, useful tool for pollinating some of our agricultural crops. But out in the flowering landscape in the natural world, we have many different flowering plants that uh, bumblebees like to buzz pollinate. So um, in some, in many cases, if the flowering plant is nectarless and just offering pollen, then the, those flowering plants will be buzz pollinated. And in addition to the other flowering plants that I mentioned earlier, uh, plants with uh, anthers that have pores or inverted anthers with pores or valves. So I call bud, the buzz pollination the crunches because that you can see that picture of a worker bumblebee visiting uh, flowering spiderwort. They actually gather themselves around the pollen producing anthers um, and then crunch over them or uh, sort of fold themselves. And then they vibrate their thoracic flight, flight muscles to vibrate the pollen. So you can actually see this them doing this, but it's quite fast and quick. Uh, I'll talk about some other plants during the presentation to look for uh, buzz pollination. The other sort of nectar, or excuse me, um, pollen collection technique I often see bumblebees is what I call the rapid Passover. So this is a queen bumblebee uh, approaching a flowering plum plant that is offering pollen and she will continue to have her wings um, beating and be passing over in a very fast manner uh, over tops of the flowers to collect pollen and then later groom that pollen. So another example would be uh, button bush, those white spherical flowers. You'll see bumblebees just quite literally buzzing around that spherical flower very, very quickly. And it's just a really fast uh, way for them to collect pollen. There's also instances where you may think a bumblebee is um, just sipping on nectar, but in fact that they may be uh, multitasking and sipping on nectar while they simultaneously collect pollen. And uh, these images are a little fuzzy because I pulled them from a video that I took. This is a brown belted bumblebee visiting blue baptisia. So you, you can see she has her head inserted into the flower. She's sipping on nectar. But what she's doing with her mid legs is pushing down the lower keel petals of that pea uh, shaped flower. And then she's moving her hind legs where her corbiculae occur in sort of a circular motion, dragging them over the exposed reproductive parts, the anthers that she's uh, exposed while she's pushing down the flower. So this is more of a uh, sort of stable or <laughs> not fast moving uh, uh, activity. So it's easier to see this versus that rapid Passover that I talked about on the previous slide. And then of course, if bumblebees are visiting flowering plants to feed or collect nectar, then they would obviously be probing the flower with their tongue, uh, searching for the nectaries uh, one thing to look for as any type of bee uh, sort of imbibes the nectar, their abdomen often pulsates. So I can sort of spot that from a distance where even if it's a small native bee, I know that they're nectaring versus collecting pollen because I can see that their abdomen is pulsating while they're probing the flower with their, their tongue. All right, so just to talk about where bumblebees occur in the landscape through the growing season, and this is sort of based upon uh, Midwestern and Eastern type landscapes with woodlands and various patchy habitats, but uh, woodlands play a really critical role for not only hibernation sites for bumblebees, but also for spring foraging. So some of those first uh, blooming plants in the woodlands before the tree 
leaves come out are critical nectar plants for emerging queens. In addition to uh, wetland areas, so here in Minnesota, the, the first flowering plant to bloom are willows, so they can provide some of the first nectar sources for bumblebees. And then as we, after nest establishment occurs, foraging sort of changes and you'll find bumblebees out in more sunny area, uh, areas where there's a larger diversity of flowering plants, so that can include places such as prairies or meadows or our home gardens is where we really start to see bumblebees uh, in the summer and autumn. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, the, you know, when you see populations and why as we go through the uh, life cycle. So obviously because of their colony cycle, bumblebees need a nu nutritious food sources, uh, ideally a diversity of native flowering plants from early spring, from the point in time those queens come out of hibernation all the way through into fall. And so thinking about how you can modify your garden that you may have and ensuring that you have a continuous supply of flowering plants. And don't forget about woody plants. I'll be talking a little bit about woody plants as we go through the seasonal phenology, but in the spring, particularly uh, flowering trees and shrubs can play a really critical role in helping to fill in that that flowering phenology. So let's walk through uh, a seasonal guide to the bumblebee life cycle and some of the native flowering plants that they enjoy visiting. And I just wanna mention on each of the slides, I will have either, a, either or a P and an N indicated for each flowering plant. So N uh, indicates that the bumblebees visit that flowering plant for nectar to either collect or consume it. P, they will visit that flowering plant to collect pollen. And then as I mentioned earlier, my little buzz pollinated uh, symbol, meaning the bumblebees will buzz pollinate that flower. So this, those symbols just represent um, bumblebees. So the example I have here is wild bergamot and bumblebees use that, utilize that plant for nectar. But keep in mind other native bees, uh, some of our smaller solitary bees, utilize a plant such as wild bergamot for pollen collection. So those symbols just uh, reflect uh, what bumblebees are using those particular plants as we go through the seasons. So as I mentioned, bumblebees have an annual colony. Uh, the queens uh, live the longest anywhere from 11 to 13 months because they are produced in the colony uh, either late summer or fall and then they uh, hibernate for the winter and then establish their own colony in the spring. So this is where uh, early spring is a really critical time period. And as I mentioned, something such as pussy willow is one of basically the first flowering plant to bloom. I usually go to the, my local wetland and check out the willows in early spring. And I'll often see some of the earlier emerging bumblebee species such as this two-spotted bumblebee. I'll find some new queens out. Um, sipping on nectar. So those queens have hibernated for many months. Just think of our snowy conditions for many of you tuning in today. They're, they've tucked themselves into a shallow burrow in the ground and they basically are burning through fat stores that they built the previous fall. So they come out of hibernation um, pretty hungry and exhausted. And this is one of the reasons why having flowering plants in early spring is really critical um, just to get the queens going and fueled so that she can start her nest searching activities. So if you're wandering through the woodlands in early spring looking for some of those first um, flowering plants blooming such as Dutchman's breeches, that's where you may uh, find new queens nest searching. And nest searching behavior is uh, they fly low to the ground, often kind of back and forth. And then when they find something that looks like a good opportunity to establish a nest, could be an abandoned rodent hole or some sort of cavity behind a rock, um, the queens will go in, they may go in for several minutes and then they'll decide whether or not um, that's an ideal place to nest. I call it the Cinderella period because they can be 
really, really picky um, finding the, the, the right place to nest. So this is where these early spring nectar sources of woodland flowering plants just simply are providing them fuel while they're doing their nest searching. And as, as in, a, in addition to those perennials, uh, some of the early flowering woody plants, such as willow that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the prunus, uh, any particularly the different species of plums, uh, they're offering nectar first, and that often coincides with nest searching activities for some of the later uh, bumblebee species. And then the queens, once they have established a nest, will return to some of the prunus to collect pollen, that rapid Passover that I talked about earlier. But thinking about some shrubs that we think of are nuisances, uh, like prickly ash, a very thorny shrub that can invade uh, more grassland and meadow habitats. Well, that's a particular plant, native plant that blooms early and can provide some additional forage to, to queen bumblebees. So she take, takes about anywhere from seven to 10 days doing this nest searching activity. And it's really dependent on where you live and the different species that occur where you are. But a lot of the intemperate regions, the bumblebee nests are either established sort of at ground level under heavy debris. Um, so the two examples here, this is a little spot in my neighborhood that I discovered two nests within five feet of each other. And one was at the end of that, sort of tucked under the end of that rotting log. And the second was under the heavy layers of plant debris and leaf litter. So some species nest at ground level with those natural insulating materials around the nest. Um, some will establish a nest below ground in abandoned rodent holes, and then less often nests could be established above ground. I've seen uh, queens nest searching in uh, tree cavities, and some uh, people often report nests occurring in abandoned nest, bird nest boxes. Last summer, I also found a nest uh, in a hole in a log lying on the ground, which to me was a little surprising. You can see the, the dry wood shavings coming out of that hole. And um, it's still a mystery to me whether the uh, workers or the queen were actually expanding the cavity in that dry log or a, another animal had done so before the queen established the nest in the log. So some, a lot, in some, for some species, wooded habitats can be very attractive Bumblebees are often looking for abandoned mouse nests. So they're using um, their olfactory senses, uh, smell of course, to find uh, abandoned mouse nests in order to establish their nest. All right, so the queen has uh, found, finally picked a spot to nest and now she is still the sole forager until she produces her first brood of workers. And this is still, this, this early spring timeframe is still a really precarious time because the queen is taking a lot of risks to go back out into the landscape, um, to collect, start collecting pollen to bring back to the nest so that she can start her egg laying. Uh, the woodland flowering plants uh, continue to play a role in providing um, different nutritional resources that she needs but she, start, she switches from the nectar feeding in initially to really seeking out pollen producing plants. So something that we wouldn't think of as an important plant um, are native violets, for example, that, that plant is utilized by bumblebees for both pollen and nectar. And amazingly, the queens often like to buzz pollinate the flowers. So you really have to get down low to the ground next to the violets to, to hear those queens uh, sonicating the flowers. And in addition, that's when some of the first uh, trees start to bloom. So if you're in the Eastern US or Southern Ontario, red bud would begin blooming before the leaves come out. And uh, it belongs to the pea family. So many of the flowering plants in the pea family provide uh, good pollen sources for bumblebees. And we've already talked about uh, blueberries, but the ericaceous plants, um, if you live in sandy habitats, you probably have many more different ericaceous plants that would require buzz pollination that uh, queen bumblebees would be collecting pollen from. 
All right, so let's take a look inside the nest. The queen has established the nest. She's gone out to find flowering plants that are producing pollen. She's collecting that pollen on her corbiculae, bringing it back to the nest and um, making a large pollen ball. So that initial pollen ball that she creates, she lays multiple eggs on top of the pollen ball. Because these nests are established in early spring with uh, fluctuating temperatures, those initial eggs often are incubated uh, by the queen. She'll sit on top of the, the pollen ball and eggs. The pollen ball is often covered with a wax coating. So similar to honeybees having the ability to produce a wax-like substance, um, bumblebees can as well. The wax is secreted from um, between their abdominal segments and they use that wax to make nectar pots, which you can see in this image. So they're just sort of these um, haphazard different size little pots. And when she's out foraging in the landscape, um, collecting pollen, she's also ingesting nectar, storing it in her crop. And then when she returns, she'll regurgitate that nectar into a nectar pot. So that's kind of a short term food store for her and later on for workers. Uh, if she gets stuck in the nest and uh, with you know, several days of rain and don't, she wouldn't have foraging conditions to go out in the landscape. She's got a little supply of food um, to, to weather that. All right, so uh, the first brood of, uh, or first offspring that she produces, all of those eggs that are initially laid on the pollen ball are female. And bees and other hymenoptera have this um, really interesting sex determination called haplodiploidy. And so if the females lay fertilized eggs, they produce female offspring. So those, when she has mated the previous fall with one male, she stores that sperm. And then while she's laying her eggs, uh, she fertilizes them. So her first brood are typically all female and her daughters or workers are now uh, a switch has occurred where once they become adults, they can go out and start foraging in the landscape for pollen and nectar so that the queen can remain safely in the nest. So woody plants are still in play, uh, plants such as bladder nut, dogwood, chokeberry, uh, wafer ash and rhododendron. You're going to see either queens or workers visiting those sort of spring flowering woody plants. And then as um, the woodland ephemerals, um, the native spring flowering shrubs finish the blooming, then really the activity shifts into more open, sunny habitats, uh, meadows, prairies, home gardens. And it's, um, the, this is, you know, in where I live in Minnesota, this would be early June. And I always find that's a difficult time of year to have an adequate supply of flowering plants because we had that bust of or burst of um, spring flowering plants. And then there's often a lull before the summer blooming plants come into play. So um, trying to find plants that fill those lulls, if you wanna call it that, uh, is really important. These are just some examples, but not obviously applicable for uh, everybody tuning in. Uh, the Midwestern prairie species, uh, prairie smoke is in the rose family and that's a really fun flowering plant that you'll find uh, either queen or worker bumblebees uh, buzz pollinating. All right, so the workers are foraging and uh, after late spring, you no longer would typically see queens out in the landscape. They're going to remain safely in the nest continuing to do all the egg laying with the workers, helping them rear uh, more offspring. So from a gardening perspective, once we get into late spring, early summer, this is where we really start to see the bumblebees increase in numbers in our gardens. And um, these are just some different early spring, late spring, early summer flowering plants. I mentioned earlier, spiderwort is a nectarless plant. So that's a plant that is solely utilized for its pollen resources, and it's also buzz pollinated. The various species of Baptisia, so there's, uh, depending on where you live, there should be at least one species in the Eastern US, uh, a very good pollen source for bumblebees. Milkweeds are an example of a plant that only offer nectar to visiting insects. The pollen is packaged 
into sticky sacs called pollinia. So any, um, any bumblebee or other flower visiting insect visiting a milkweed plant would be just seeking out nectar. Other perennials, so sometimes there's a few uh, flower, remaining flowering plants that are occurring in shady conditions. Uh, some of our early blooming figwort species are really fun and interesting plants and attract a number of different flower visiting insects for, for their nectar. Uh, one, of the, one of the plants I find really unusual, the metal roos in the genus Thalictrum, that they're actually separate male and female plants, uh, wind pollinated, but uh, many different types of native bees will visit the male plants to collect the pollen. So that's an image of a worker bumblebee visiting a tall metal roo. The mints, so this is where some of the earlier mints start to bloom. So plants in the mint family, Lamiaceae. Uh, the, I just started planting a, a number of wood mints in the genus Blephelia in my garden. And again, I really like that plant because it fills that, that lull that I talked about between spring and summer blooming plants. Now, most or all mints um, in that family are primarily nectar sources for bumblebees. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Like I talked about earlier with the wild bergamot. Native roses, so forget about the uh, double flowered hybrid tea and all those other fancy roses. If you can find just a straight species of one, one of a native rose that is native to your area, those are excellent pollen sources for bumblebees. And um, they have that open flower form, single petals, a big whirl of stamens and anthers in the center. And that is a really fun plant that you'll find many different native bees buzz pollinating. For, for many years ago, I planted some uh, native roses in a restoration. And when I'd visit that site, I'd often go in the afternoon and I was really perplexed, I thought, why aren't there any pollinators visiting the native rose? And I realized that um, all of that pollen extraction occurs in, in the morning. So by about 10.30 or 11 a.m., um, all of the native bees have extracted all the pollen that the flowers have produced for that day. So sometimes um, you need to be an early riser to, to see some of these things happening in the landscape. All right, so summer, this is where we, we shift to really primarily uh, flowering annuals and perennials in our landscapes. And we have many things to choose from in our gardens uh, and to enhance different flower colors, flower forms for not only bumblebees, but many other native bee species. Purple prairie clover and white prairie clover are in the pea family. So that's uh, an excellent plant if you live in the Midwest. Uh, to, to add to your garden. If you have uh, sandy conditions, uh, that, that pollen is really sought after by particular bumblebee species. Plants in the Hypericum genus are also nectarless. So that's strictly a pollen plant for bumblebees. Another one that gets buzz pollinated. So you can start to see patterns in the flower forms if you compare that Hypericum photo with the rose photo. So the open sort of disc um, shaped form, that big whirl of anthers and stamens in the middle um, can help you indicate that that is a, a nectarless plant. The verveins, uh, including plants in the verbena genus, are primarily nectar sources for bumblebees and the nectar is very nutritious, high in sugar concentrations. So helping those workers continue their, their activities of collecting pollen. So the, the queen has done continued egg laying and the workers help her continue to rear more offspring. And sometime in summer, she switches to laying unfertilized eggs. So that starts the production of male bumblebees. This is a particular bumblebee species, not all male bumblebee species uh, establish territories. This is a black and gold bumblebee. And <laughs> you can see many of the male bumblebee species have large eyes. So with the reason is they really spend almost all of their time uh, looking for a new female or new queen. And there he is perched on a top, tall flower that he has found in a prairie. Um, that is his territory. He's not only looking for new queens to mate with, 
but he's also chasing off any other males and in some cases, <laughs> any dragonflies or birds that enter his uh, territory. So if you find some little territorial um, male territories, it's really fun to, to visit while they're doing their nest searching activity. Um, I, I found a spot last summer in a, in a restored short grass prairie that had about 15 different males scattered throughout a two acre prairie that all had set up their own little space there to, to fend for, for their female that they may find. All right, so males are produced, and as I mentioned at the beginning, they are nectar feeding. So that's where you may see some differences in what plants, flowering plants, male versus female or worker bumblebees are visiting. So males are going to be drawn to plants such as milkweeds that are just offering nutritious nectar, whereas females are going to continue looking for pollen producing plants um, to bring back more pollen to the nest. So the wild senna is another fun plant to utilize if it's native to your area, it's in the pea family. It just produces pollen, so it's a nectarless plant and that is another fun one that bumblebees love to buds pollinate. And then there are a few woody plant, native woody plants that bloom in the summer. So I just thought I'd feature a few on this slide. Uh, if you're in the Midwest or in prairie areas, lead plant is a excellent plant to plant for not only bumblebees, but a number of uh, our solitary native bees that specialize on plants in the genus Amorpha. And as I mentioned earlier, button bush, uh, that rapid fire pollen collection that you may see a bumblebee collecting the pollen. And you can see how those anthers really protrude from the flower. And that really helps facilitate that rapid uh, spinning around on that spherical flower form for uh, pollen collection. So the queen uh, switches back to uh, laying fertilized eggs and those will be destined to be new queens and the new queens uh, leave the nest shortly after the males are produced in the colony. Now they um, spend about three days inside of the nest after they close um, just hanging out, getting uh, their exoskeleton to finish developing and hardening. Um, th at that point in time, and it's not well known, they may be actually feeding on a little bit of pollen inside of the nest, but there are really no observations of these new queens while they go out and forage in the landscape consuming pollen. So their primary way to build the fat stores that I mentioned to survive hibernation is through uh, feeding on plants that are very have very good, uh, good quality nectar. So they, they spend about anywhere from seven to 12 days practicing these foraging flights, going out into the landscape, uh, feeding on nectar, then returning to their natal nest. And while they are out is when the males uh, find them to, to mate with them. So this pre-hibernation feeding is really, really important, uh, particularly from the perspective of how do we help bumblebees in the landscape. And if they have uh, nutritional stress, you can imagine that will directly impact their, uh, the, whether or not they will survive their hibernation and build enough fat stores. So they really need nutritional sources. And uh, some of the flowering plants, particularly ones that are high in sugar concentration are very important. So I just put some examples on this slide, asters, uh, blazing stars, goldenrods, milkweed, sunflowers, wild bergamot, uh, ironwood and tick seeds. So many of those belong to the uh, aster family, which makes sense because those plants uh, tend to dominate the, the flowering world in uh, late summer and autumn. So this is a picture of a male who has found a female, a new queen while she's out foraging and uh, he is mating with her. So they typically mate only with one male and after mating and after feeding on an adequate supply of nectar and building those fat stores through hormonal and other physiological changes, um, basically a switch is, is uh, switched and then the queen uh, knows that she is ready to go and disperse and search for a place to hibernate. Uh, 
Uh, but, in, and you'll still see going back to the workers, they're still working hard. Uh, even in late summer, um, they may be producing some of the last new queens in the colony. So there are still some flowering plants that bloom in late summer that you'll find workers in addition to males visiting uh, in, the, in their last days. Uh, some more flowering plants that you may find new queens uh, uh, visiting to, to sip on nectar, uh, in addition to the males who are just, their life, their life is about to end, unfortunately. And people often ask me, what, what are all the bumblebees out sitting on the flowers overnight in, in late summer and autumn? And those are the males. They, they don't return to the nest once they're produced and leave as, an, as adults. So they spend their days looking for nectar sources and uh, looking for females. So their life is very short. And as we get uh, colder temperatures and flowering plants are not producing as many resources as they were in midsummer, um, that's when the colony starts to slow down and decline. The queen may uh, die at this point, and so it's sort of a race with the remaining workers and males to continue on um, with their foraging, but really not for any specific effort because uh, the colony is basically done by that point. So by fall, even though we have goldenrods and asters and all these other wonderful flowering plants out, they're primarily providing nectar for male bumblebees, but these uh, plants that I have on this slide are extremely important for many of our solitary native bees that are active in late summer and early autumn. So we have a number of specialists of goldenrods and asters and sunflowers that really rely on these, what I call the fall bookend plants. So even though they're not um, as important for bumblebees, uh, they are really important for other types of native bees. All right, so the queens, the new queens uh, have built up their fat stores. And uh, in some cases, some species may disperse uh, a fair distance, but it's also not unusual for them to not disperse very far at all. This is a picture that I took from a video that I took last fall. And uh, Elaine Evans from the University of Minnesota got in touch, touch with me and she said that they had found a, uh, a hibernation aggregation in, in the backyard of a homeowner's house. So I went over and sure enough, the, the queens were busy excavating their shallow hibernation burrows. So this is really the only time that bumblebees would do any kind of excavation, unlike solitary female bees that are ground nesting, they're doing uh, an enormous amount of excavation to, to create their nesting uh, nest structure below ground. But really this is the only time that the queens are doing any kind of uh, digging. So this is a common Eastern bumblebee new queen uh, starting to dig her burrow. And the burrows are quite shallow, just a couple of inches deep. And what's, what is interesting about the common Eastern bumblebee is many new queens will excavate their burrows in close proximity. So this is a picture, each of those bamboo stakes uh, represent a excavated burrow, a partially excavated burrow. Sometimes they get abandoned, um, but Elaine had been monitoring uh, the, the excavation activity. So this is the back of the homeowner's um, garage, the, the things stacked that you see in the back of this picture. The nest, uh, the nest that these queens were produced from was actually located underneath that garage. So within 10 to 15 feet of these um, aggreg aggregation burrows. So these, these new queens didn't fly very far at all to prepare for their hibernation. And thankfully the homeowner contacted the university so that they uh, had the correct information to know not to disturb these uh, overwintering queens. So nutritional stress is uh, one of the major factors that is impacting bumblebees, but of course it's often a lot of different interacting factors. So uh, pesticide use, uh, introduced pathogens from commercial bumblebees in addition to uh, honeybees can impact bumblebee populations. But of course, just our flowerless landscapes are highly fragmented habitat. Uh, climate change, all of these things will be 
causing um, nutritional stress for bumblebees. So hopefully I've given you a lot of ideas about how to help bumblebees and specific flowering plants that they, they like. And of course, going back to that concept of this applies for all native bees, having that uh, continuous succession of flowering plants. And that includes the woody plants, the trees and shrubs, in addition to perennials. And now you have a better understanding of um, not all plants are providing uh, both resources for a foraging bee, such as a bumblebee. So some are good pollen plants and some are good nectar plants. So you need a, a nice balance. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, for those of you that are tuning in and all the plants I showed today don't apply uh, to where you live. I tried to sort of pull out some of the predominant plant families and hopefully they apply to where you live. But the, the rose family, the pea family, and the heath or ericaceous family are really critical pollen sources for bumblebees, in addition to the nightshade and aster family. So not all aster um, flowering plants are pollen sources. Many of them are nectar sources for bumblebees, but I just listed a few that uh, bumblebees are seeking out pollen. And then if we look at that from the point of view of what are the primary nectar plants for bumblebees. Uh, the mint family is very predominant. So any, any flowering plant that belongs to the mint family, bumblebees love as a nectar source. Uh, in addition to the asters that I talked about, all of those uh, fun prairie and savanna plants, uh, black-eyed Susans, you name it, uh, that typical aster flower form. And then many pea, um, pea plants do produce nectar. I highlighted some that were nectarless, but they the, that family also is a good source of nectar for bumblebees. And I threw in one more family there that includes the turtle heads and penstemons, um, because those are two pretty predominant plants that, that bumblebees utilize. So thanks so much for tuning in. Um, this is the bumblebee high five. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. So if you if you pet a male bumblebee, he raises his uh, mid leg up in protest. So I thought that would be a fun uh, image to finish off this presentation. And I look forward to answering any questions about plants for bumblebees. So thanks. Great, thank you, Heather. So wonderful, and you answered lots of our questions in the um, the Q and A box as you as you uh, summarize at the end. So I really appreciate that. And you know, uh, for our participants, uh, if you do a screenshot or go back and watch the video and do a screenshot, then you can have those lists there uh, right on your, your computer. So we have something um, close to 300 questions. We definitely won't get to all of them, um, but I tried to sort of uh, put them into groups, Heather. So. Uh, first of all, there were a lot of questions about robbing and um, also kind of the difference was between, sorry, I'm going to back up and just say, folks, if you need to leave because we're on the hour, um, I'm sure Heather would appreciate a thank you in the chat box. Um, we'll keep recording. So the Q&A portion will be on the recording so you can come back. So don't feel bad if you have to hop out. Thanks for coming. Um, so there were questions about um, how do I tell a carpenter bee from a bumblebee? So maybe just a quick recap about that. And then what is robbing? Okay, so carpenter bees typically have a, a shiny black abdomen that's relatively hairless. Um, they also have a larger um, head and larger compound eyes. And so that's usually what I look for is the hairiness. And bumblebees will have all of their abdominal segments covered with various hairs, colors of hairs. So look for that shiny black abdomen and sort of large broad shoulders and big head of the comforter bee. Nectar robbing uh, occurs in the short tongue bumblebees as well as the car large carpenter bee are famous nectar robbers. So they will use their mandibles to chew a hole at the bottom of a flower corolla and that then becomes a place that they can insert their tongue to reach the nectaries. So they don't legitimately <laughs> visit the flower um, because their tongues are not long enough to reach those nectaries through the uh, opening of the flower corolla. Let's see, you mentioned rose as an example of a flower that uh, will replenish its resource. And there were several questions about how do, how do plants do that? What kind of cycle do they have or how do they replenish the nectar or the pollen? What's the schedule like? Yeah, it's really 
plant specific. So wild bergamot is a, an example of a plant that if it, it's getting enough moisture and sunlight for photosynthesis, then that, that plant will continuously replenish its nectar during the day. So that's why you'll see foraging on uh, wild bergamot from early morning all the way to dusk. <laughs> but then other plants are serving up their full uh, supply of nectar in the morning, the replenishment has happened overnight. And then if the uh, frequency of flower visiting insects extracting that nectar, as soon as the nectar stores are depleted, that plant will, will no longer be offering nectar until it replenishes overnight. So that's more of a uh, 24 hour cycle, I guess you would call it. So it's very plant specific. Um, I think not everybody, I don't think there's, you know, information on every single flowering plant and its cycle. So that's another way that um, people and citizen scientists can help if they're super observant, they, they may be able to figure that out. Great, thanks. So I will um, put a plug in for Pollinators of Native Plants, Heather's wonderful book. If you don't have this on your bookshelf, you, you need it. it um, I just pulled a one page, for example, the Ahori Vervain, the uh, Verbena, um, lots of great pictures, all the different kinds of pollinators who are visiting good plant information when it's blooming, what its range is. So many of the questions in the chat were specific about different native plants. So I'll just point that to you as a, a great resource to, uh, to answer some of those plants questions. Uh, Heather, what kind of foraging range do bumblebees have? Yeah, so they um, they can usually wouldn't go farther than a mile. So you think about that energy expenditure I talked about. They don't want to burn all the calories they've consumed just looking for floral resources. So ideally, they're going to not go too far from the nest if there's an abundant amount of flowering plants. Uh, some research has indicated that they can find the nest if they're transported seven or eight miles away, um, but that would seem pretty uh, unusual for bumblebees to naturally forage those distances. So I would think up to a mile is typical, but that, that's also something that's um, particularly hard to quantify. So I, I think you may know more, Denise, of more recent studies, but I'm sure there's little transponders or something that have been utilized to answer that question. Right, I think we need more engineers who can work on that very small scale to get those transponders to, to hang on to the bees. To hang on, yeah. To monitor them. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so lots of interest in queens um, and how they overwinter also ways that um, folks in the audience can help queens either are there artificial nesting strategies what plants can help uh, queens nest um, are can you move nests once the queen has found a, a spot so the kind of queen focus there okay yeah, so the, there are some different designs online for bumblebee nest boxes. Um, I've heard people have varying success in attracting a bumblebee. More success, to my knowledge, in Europe. <laughs> they have quite, um, for example, in the UK, they've had great success attracting bumblebees to the, they're basically wood boxes with a, an entry. The key thing that people do where they do have success is collecting uh, old mouse nests. So again, going back to that smell that the queen may be utilizing while she's doing her nest searching um, could help lure in a bumblebee to a, a structured nesting site. But again, it's about gardening practices, you know, leaving things a little messier, uh, having natural debris on the ground that provides attractive places for bumblebees and also for mice um, that, that will help uh, encourage bumblebees to nest in your yard. Okay, back to the other part. Let me think what, what <laughs> you have to remind me, Denise, sorry. Oh, I'll have to move a nest. Can you move a bubble? Oh, moving a nest. So, yeah, so native bees uh, do a lot of orientation as they leave a nest. Um, they'll do little orientation flights, including bumblebees. So when you move a nest, it's really throws them off. Um, people have various uh, success, uh, you know, collecting a nest and moving it at night and then repositioning it in a different location. I've heard that you need to put it at least 60 feet away from its original location, but often the nest is not very successful for much longer when, when it's been moved. So something I wouldn't recommend unless you uh, absolutely have to move the nest, but 
Okay, so the question that got the most upvotes was about Menarda. And um, it's a it's an answer you may not have. Maybe together we can we can talk about it. But the question was, does powdery mildew that gets on bee balm affect those pollinating insects? Not that I'm aware of, and maybe you've heard different, Denise. Um, it, I find if I grow Menarda in you know open habitats, good good wind, um, that I don't worry too much about powdery mildew because it doesn't seem to affect. Um, the plant's ability to produce flowers and nectar and so on for, for bees, but I'll let you chip in, yeah. Right, and I would agree with that, that usually the powdery mildew is a leaf pathogen, so we see it on the leaves, but it doesn't really affect the flowers, so I'm not sure that it would even be something that the bees would possibly, you know, gather and transport, but again, native plants and native bees, they've evolved together, and so um, I'm not sure about this pathogen, whether it's I mean, it most likely is native, but I'm not sure. Um, but there, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's detrimental um, just because it's detrimental to the plant doesn't mean it's detrimental to the bee. I did a really quick um, um, Google Scholar search and didn't see any papers that talked about that, but I thought I'd, I'd address it since lots of people had questions about that. Um, so usually powdery mildew is more cosmetic, right? It bothers the gardeners, um, but doesn't seem to affect um, the bees. Exactly, yeah. There were questions about uh, stings and a few participants who noted that um, they've been gardening for a long time, their neighbors have children, and the children have been stung and, and how to kind of finesse that. I know you've worked a lot in your community with other groups that are starting pollinator gardens and how do you kind of approach that issue of, of stings? Yeah, I, I look at it from behaviorally. So if bees are visiting flowering plants, I call that they're, they're out at the restaurant and usually stinging occurs through nest offense. So it's, it's pretty unusual to get stung by a bumblebee unless you pick one up in your hand. <laughs> and of course, if it's a female, she will sting you. Or um, in many cases, bumblebees will be flying and get caught in the clothing of a gardener and then sting. But it's pretty unusual for children running around um, a garden to, to get stung. So often I sort of question whether it was actually uh, a native bee versus perhaps a, a ground nesting yellow jacket that was, was really the insect that they got stung by. So um, obviously don't disturb a bumblebee nest if you find one, but they do a lot of sort of um, buzzing and um, threatening flying around, but their last resort would be to sting someone. So they, they're not out and actively looking to, to sting us. So I, that's, hopefully we can look at it from that perspective that they wanna be our friends and we just have to respect where they live. <laughs> When I think it's neat that for a lot of people, their gateway bee is the bumblebee. Some, yeah. you know, gardeners remember as children petting bumbles as they visit flowers. And when they're foraging, they're really thinking about the flowers. They're not so worried about you. So um, yeah. they, they do tend to be a really gentle bee, except if they're nesting. <laughs> uh, let's see. So there were... Um, several questions related to how we manage our gardens or even larger uh, meadow areas. And do you have suggestions for how to, you know, timing, cutbacks, uh, other management strategies that will help bumblebees specifically? Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, like my own gardening practices, I generally am not removing anything from my garden. Um, so if you're, I leave all the flowering plant stalks up for the winter, and then I really try and pay attention to what's happening phenologically in the spring um, and then cut down stuff, but allow that debris to become more of that uh, debris layer, which I would hope that is attractive to bumblebees. So if you can time your things um, before queens have established a nest, so uh, a, good, a good thing to look for is queen nest searching, and that might be uh, your your indicator to get that get your gardening stuff done pretty quickly, meaning cutting stuff down, and then try and stay out of the garden after that. So the less that you are doing and disturbing um, is is better for many of our pollinating and beneficial insects. So I really do one round of cut down in my garden, and that's pretty much it for for the growing season. <laughs> 
go. I will put a quick plug in for the Bumblebee short course that will be our next webinar series here with OSU and I'll send everyone a, um, information about that. We'll be, we'll be focusing specifically on Bumblebee biology, identification and conservation. So look for that coming up. Um, Heather, your photography just got so many oohs and ahs uh, in the, the question in the chat box. Um, any kind of uh, tips or suggestions for people who would like to, to you know, take those observations for iNaturalist or just do some, some great garden photography? How do you get those, uh, those great bee pics? Yeah, I, I would say start with um, your movements and not, you know, anticipating and watching um, bumblebee behavior or other native bees. You, you'll start to learn what plants they like. So uh, the other key thing is smooth movements, meaning approach the flowering plant slowly so you don't scare off um, the bee. And then um, just have the camera ready. So I don't do a lot of cell phone related photography, but I do use my cell phone for, for video, uh, particularly for slow motion video. So that's a fun way to capture uh, grooming and foraging behaviors to help, to help you understand what, what is it exactly that the bee is doing while visiting flowers. So buzz pollination in slow motion is really fun <laughs> to capture on your cell phone. So if you have a flowering rose plant, get up early in the morning, go sit by it, and because you know the bees will come there. And so just being in the right place at the right time is, is one of the really key things. Okay. A lot of people have strong opinions about using non-native plants in the garden or cultivars. And I wonder what your perspective is as far as what bees are using and how people can kind of balance that dynamic. Yeah, yeah. so a lot of the, non-native plants that people use in the gardens that bumblebees in particular are really attracted to are often nectar plants. So that's not a necessarily a bad thing, but um, just on a superficial level, some people think, oh, this bumblebees love this plant and that's fine. But um, hopefully, you know, what I tried to illustrate today is uh, having an abundance of nectar plants is great, but we, we have to have that complement of of those pollen plants. And those are generally uh, native plants that bumblebees would be use, utilizing for pollen. So no, nothing harmful in including non-native plants that are attractive to bumblebees, as long as they don't um, have the potential to become invasive, of course, but you have to think of it as a holistic um, planning in order to provide all those wonderful food sources for bees. Great, thanks Heather. So I'll let everyone know that we've had Heather several times as a webinar speaker. I think you can see why she's so knowledgeable and um, has a great presentation style and those amazing images. If you go back to our YouTube channel, you'll find some of those past recordings or if you visit the Bee Lab website, uh, we have those past recordings linked. She did one last year on her book on wasps, um, others on, on specialist bees and how to manage habitat for all these great pollinators. So um, be sure to look for some of Heather's past uh, teachings to, to gain more insight from her. Uh, and then Heather, just a couple words about your new book. I'm really excited to, to get it. Oh yeah, that's just sort of, that's truly a beginner's guide. Uh, I partnered with a, another publisher so it will showcase um, the different genera in Eastern North America and some common species. So it'll be um, the book to get for that friend of yours that's just starting to get interested in, in native bees and understanding diversity. So it's for many of those folks tuning in that may be um, not as advanced as they'd like, but that's, that's the purpose of the new guide. That's great, great, can't wait to see it. So thanks again, Heather. Thanks everyone for coming. And uh, I know you got lots of, of notes and ideas for plants to add to your garden from today's talk. Um, excited to see everyone next Friday for Deborah Kanapke and uh, enjoy, your, enjoy your week. Thank you. Thanks, Heather.